Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Glenn Deason. I'm a professor of political science. And uh, with me today is uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor. He's a military man with long experience, uh, including le leading troops on the battlefield. He is also an intellectual, has written several books on military strategy, and also a political man, I would say, advising uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, it's great to see you again. Well, it's good to see you, but I don't claim to be an intellectual. <laughs> Fair enough. That's a full-time job that uh, I can't afford, so. Uh, I I wanted to ask you, though, about the uh, first, about the state of this counteroffensive, because, well, we armed Ukraine to the teeth to fight against Russia, and we pinned our hopes uh, on this political offensive uh, leading to a final victory as our only envisioned outcome. However, it hasn't gone that well. So I was just wondering, uh, can you outline, outline the status uh, on the ground and uh, what's happened and where is this heading? Are we seeing the end of it? <clears throat> well, I think it's fair to say that uh, ground operations are largely over for the Ukrainian military. Uh, their losses have been horrific. Uh, I've seen estimates of over 430,000 dead uh, Ukrainian soldiers now. Some people are estimating uh, higher numbers. You're not hearing that in the West because the media, of course, censors any information like that. Uh, I've always stuck uh, with the figure of 400,000 dead, but now I'm being told that's low-balling it. How many hundreds of thousands of wounded is hard to tell. Now, there were there was a report, uh, I think, by President Putin of 71,000 Ukrainian soldiers killed. Uh, that may be accurate. Uh, to be frank with you, the Russians have been far more honest about losses, theirs and Ukrainian, than we have. Uh, Americans won't like to hear that, but our government simply hasn't been very honest about the whole thing. So I think the uh, Ukrainian ground war, for all intents and purposes, is either at a standstill or perhaps even over. Uh, they're desperate for manpower, and they're trying to force people into uniform inside the country that are not really capable of fighting. And as you know, they're trying to repatriate Ukrainians from overseas of military age. But I don't see that happening. I don't think most of the governments in Europe are willing to expend the, the manpower to go out and forcibly arrest and then deport uh, young Ukrainian men. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I just don't think that's going to happen. So I think we're in a new phase, and a friend uh, contacted me today, and he, he said to me, I think we're now entering Biden's phase of the war. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, having run out of ground forces to throw at the enemy, the only thing the Ukrainians can do now is acquire long-range strike weapons, like the Storm Shadow or the Taurus missile, and then hurl those at the uh, Russians. And I think that's what we recently saw. We had a big strike launched against Crimea. I think it was a total of 11 Storm Shadow missiles launched from SU-24s that took to the air, launched their missiles, and then rapidly uh, disappeared for fear of being shot down. And of the 11 missiles, eight were, in fact, uh, destroyed by Russian integrated air defenses, but three got through and caused some significant damage to ships that were sitting in in you know, dry dock or at the, in the harbor at Sevastopol. <clears throat> you also saw the use of some uh, drones uh, that are, are used underwater. We, we prefer to say uh, underwater unmanned systems, but people now use the word drone all the time. But uh, I think they were of uh, British origin, much like the storm shadows. The thing that's most disturbing <clears throat> is that both U.S. and British and potentially French ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance platforms, unmanned and potentially manned, were used to help guide these strikes, both the uh, underwater unmanned systems and the storm shadow missiles. That would also include a, a global hawk. The Russians have previously downed a global hawk over the Black Sea, and apparently we used another global hawk to assist in this strike. The reason that's disturbing should be obvious to all of your listeners. This means that we are co-belligerents for all intents and purposes. The real question is, how much longer will the, will the Russians restrain themselves from attacking the source of these uh, weapons and capabilities, namely Great Britain, uh, the United States, France, potentially even Germany?
So I, I don't know the answer to that. So the, the point is that we're in a new phase. This is kind of a long-range strike phase because the Ukrainians have nothing else to throw into the throw into the mix. And it's a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, I think the Russians are now finally coming to the reality that the only way that this will end is if they end it militarily. And so I'm I'm watching carefully to see if there are preparations for a serious uh, offensive. Keep in mind that uh, some of the strikes in the Black Sea area against the Russians were launched from the coast uh, that lies between Odessa and the Romanian border. And that's not very far for the Russians to, to reach. So one wonders how long the Russians will wait before they cross the Dnieper River and ultimately take control of Odessa and that southern coastline. It's obviously in their security interest to do so. But we don't know. We don't we don't know precisely what's happening in Moscow and the general staff. We don't know what instructions are being given by President Putin to his forces in the field. So we're in we're in the wait phase to see what happens next. Yeah, I was going to say the same that uh, in these attacks on Crimea, we see it's being used uh, NATO missiles and it's NATO intelligence that picks the targets. And then it's NATO trained soldiers that uh, push the button. So. Uh, it seems uh, we keep convincing ourselves that we're not a uh, participant to this war, but uh, uh, obviously if it was reversed and the Russians were doing this on the American border, uh, you know, directing deep strikes and arming deep strikes in, within the United States, uh, I guess our side would not buy the argument that the Russians would not be participants. So, uh, so again, from my perspective, I think if we are participants uh, in this war with Russia now, which happens to be the largest nuclear power, but how far can this go, though, before NATO strikes back? Uh, sorry, R- Russia strikes back at NATO because uh, I know w- w- what's constraining the Russians is they, w- they don't want to risk a nuclear war uh, or even a conventional war with NATO. But the risk of doing nothing continues to grow seemingly as the West escalates uh, with heavier weapons. So at least what I hear uh, louder voices in Moscow saying is that uh, uh, yeah, Putin has been too soft. Uh, again, that's the argument uh, from from Moscow that he hasn't uh, that by yeah, not not retaliating, it's emboldening the West to say, hey, the, the Russians don't dare to retaliate. We can do what we want. I mean, uh, how do, do, do you do you think the Russians will strike back? If so, who would they attack? Would they go after the Poles, the British? Uh... Well, you look, you framed the question very well. Uh, do the risks? of direct assaults on, on Ukrainian forces to do the risks of an all-out offensive to end this war outweigh uh, the risks of uh, doing nothing. Uh, right now, I think people in, in Russia are very, very, very sensitive to the attacks that have been launched against Russians on Russian soil. There's no question about it. Remember, every government has an obligation to protect its population. That's primarily why we maintain the armed forces. I think the Russian military has done the best it can, but there's a realization that it's going to take more than simply building effective defenses. So I don't know when the decision will be made, but I suspect there are serious talks happening right now. Remember, there are 300,000 troops uh, in reserve that could be launched by the Russians against what remains of Ukraine anytime they want to do it. What we don't know is what is the logistical picture? Uh, Have they the logistics in place to sustain an offensive over the river and into western Ukraine? I think they probably do, but I don't know the answer to that question. And logistics really drive a lot of the operational uh, decisions uh, in war. And right now, I don't know the status of logistical readiness on the Russian side. But there's no doubt that their general officers at the senior level in Moscow and members of uh, uh, President Putin's advisory staff, members of the government are all urging offensive action. There's no question about that. Again, this man Putin, I think, has always wanted to avoid a direct confrontation with NATO and the United States. He's probably thinking that if he waits a little longer, the situation inside Europe economically and the situation financially and economically at home in the United States may do some of the work for him. I mean, we're, we're looking at 
an expectation that interest rates in Europe will rise to 6% over the next few months. Europe is in a lot of trouble energy-wise. Uh, Germany, of course, we, we know the situation there. They're in, into a recession that looks like it could become a depression. Situation in France is equally unstable. So perhaps that's in the back of his mind, that if they could exercise some patience, conditions will change. But there's no certainty there because you've got to change governments. Our government is not scheduled for any massive change, if you will, until November of 2024, assuming we get to 2024 without major crises. I don't know what the situation in Europe is. I, I would have long ago expected no confidence votes in places like Germany or Great Britain, but they haven't happened. So it's a this is a difficult question, and the Russians have to answer it, and there's no easy answer. But I think that increasingly the pressure to act and launch a major offensive to put an end to these strikes uh, and put an end, frankly, to the Zelensky regime is is reaching the <clears throat> excuse me the boiling point. I just don't know when it's going to boil over. Well, you mentioned now that the <clears throat> thing that Biden says, the long-range missiles, because well, whenever things don't go well for us, we tend to escalate by supplying heavier and longer-range weapons. Uh, mm. And, uh, of course, uh, with the goal of being using them also now against uh, the territory of the Russian Federation. But I think you know, Biden and various political leaders, they tend to argue that, you know, we can't send this one weapon because it's too provocative. It can start World War III. However, a few months or weeks later, uh, we go ahead or they go ahead and supply this weapon. So it began with the HIMARS. Uh, then there was the uh, Abram tanks, uh, F-16, cluster ammunition, depleted uranium. and uh, But now it seems, uh, which is why I thought it was interesting what you said, this is a new stage. Because I was curious if these attackers, uh, these long-range uh, ballistic missiles they're supplying now, if that's a, a very different well, kind of animal, different weapons. Because uh, also when Blinken was asked about these weapons uh, at a hear press hearing, he, he was asked if uh, these weapons would be used to strike deep inside Russia. And his response was, it's their decision, not ours. And again, this for some, this almost sounds like a declaration of war because uh, it's certainly different, at least, from previous statements that Ukraine had promised not to strike Russian territory, and now it's long-range weapons, and they can strike if they want. I mean, I don't know much about attackers, but how serious is this escalation from uh, NATO side or the United States? Well, the ATAC missile, much like the Taurus missile, the Taurus missile is a cruise missile. The ATAC missile is a high-altitude rocket. Uh, there, these munitions reach out hundreds of miles. So you're talking about a much greater military operational reach than anything we've seen before. This puts a number of Russian towns and cities in the target area that were not there previously. And as you point out, we have always said we would not risk this uh, by placing it in Ukrainian hands. Now, obviously, I suspect that all of these are operated for the most part by non-Ukrainians anyway, probably contractors or NATO uh, military advisors. The point is that this is a new phase now. The, the war is lost on the ground. That's not going to be won. I think people are coming to that reality in the West. So they turn to the long-range strike. The ball is in the proverbial court of Russia. If the Russians are going to continue to sit on the defense, then they're going to be subjected to attack. So they may conclude the only way to end this is to turn around and attack on the ground as well as in the air with with a substantial offensive fighting power. Now, you keep mentioning nuclear weapons, and I think it's important for people to understand there is no interest in Russia, and frankly, I see no interest in Washington in turning to nuclear weapons. Now, you could make the argument that since Washington is already crossing a number of red lines, why not consider crossing that one in the future as well? I do think there is an understanding that that red line is Armageddon. And thus, I don't see any evidence that uh, people are that deranged in Washington, D.C., that they would risk the survival of our country as well as the West and civilization more broadly by using nuclear weapons. So I don't think that's going to happen. I know the Russians have no intention of using those unless they are attacked by a nuclear weapon. 
So instead, what we've got is a another escalation. You have probably the within a month or so the largest exercise yet to be held near Russia in the Baltic. Uh, this includes 40, 50 uh, very, very expensive and very sophisticated fighters and fighter bombers and bombers from the United States, as well as aircraft from other NATO nations. The total I've seen is 40,000 uh, uniformed members, Air Force, Navy, Army from NATO exercising in the Baltic. Uh, I don't know why we are doing it other than to escalate. And we could face a very serious crisis by doing so. We don't know how the Russians will interpret it. Again, the Russians have exercised a great deal of restraint. And then, of course, there's the potential for an accident. Somebody strays into, into the wrong airspace. Someone accidentally launches a weapon. All sorts of stupid things can happen that then precipitate a real shooting war between NATO and Russia. It's a dangerous phase, and that's why I've been saying now for some time that we've reached a more dangerous point in this war than any that we've seen before, because the war on the ground is effectively over. There's, there's nothing the Ukrainians can do but sacrifice more lives pointlessly. That means it's all long-range strike. That means NATO is going to use whatever it's got in support of Ukraine, and they're going to do it ostensibly pretending that these weapons are being given to Ukrainians when, in fact, NATO is behind it. So you know, what, do we, what do we expect the Russians to do? How much more patience will they exercise? You know, I can't answer these questions. Yeah, you mentioned accidents, but, uh, <clears throat> but Zelensky has uh, well, quite clearly demonstrated his intentions that he would like to drag NATO into this war. He makes statements, of course, that... Uh, uh, we should also feel the pain of this war in the West. And uh, obviously, um, when uh, when the Ukrainian missile went into Poland, uh, he was very pushing very hard to insist this was a Russian to get NATO in. We saw the same in Romania. Uh, so with this long-range uh, missiles, uh, if, if you would strike a Russian nuclear power plant or send sabotage missions, uh, this would make it very difficult for Russia not to retaliate against NATO if uh, effectively a nuclear disaster occurs on Russian soil as a result of weapons that we supplied. Uh, I, I also see this in the context of these attacks currently going on in Crimea with the West, you know, we're very uh, giddy and eager that, uh, you know, the entire Russian Black Sea fleet could be destroyed. And uh, again, this is very serious as this war is to a large extent about control of the Black Sea. Indeed, I would argue to a large extent, the uh, toppling of the Ukrainian government in 2014 was, uh, to a large extent, also to get the uh, sorry to get the Russians uh, out of Sevastopol. So um, I'm just curious of uh, what is uh, uh, what, what is the thinking currently in, in uh, Washington? As you know, you 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 tend to go there from time to time. What uh, what, what are what what is the logic? Are they given that Zelensky shows he wants to pull NATO in? We're giving him the weapons making him able to do so is there, is there no second thoughts or what is the what is the logic behind this well logic is a strong word that i don't think applies to thinking inside washington i think we're dealing with people that are acting largely on impulse uh, if everything you've done has failed and that's been the case with the united states what do you do you, you try something else but you do not stand up and say look this has not worked uh, so we're we're now going to try to negotiate because everything else we've done has failed. No one will stand up and say that in Washington. The original goal, go back and look at the statements that were made back in February and March. Look at the proposals the Russians submitted in December and January of 2021 and 2022. We rejected all of those proposals. All of those related to troops and weapons placed on Russia's borders. We would not even entertain them. Then once the the Russians were goaded into action by us in February of 22, then we said, well, Russia has to be harmed. It has to be harmed to the point where it no longer presents a threat to us or anyone in Europe or anywhere else. Then we said the regime really needs to change. Then we said, no, we don't want to change the regime, but we really think that Putin needs to go. I mean, we've been down this sort of confusing road with vague goals that are 
outrageously unrealistic and always were. We said we're going to harm the economy. Well, that hasn't worked, but we've harmed ourselves terribly. We've done enormous damage to our lives. Perhaps America's most important ally in Europe is Germany, and we've done enormous damage to Germany. We say we don't want the Germans and the Russians to cooperate, yet we're creating conditions that would lead the Germans to conclude that they're better off cooperating with the Russians than they are co cooperating with us. So everything that we've tried has backfired. Instead of a, a rational discussion, which is what you're looking for, that re-examines all the steps we've taken, looks at what the Russians have done, and saying, let's talk, let's halt all operations at this point, cease operations, meet somewhere uh, with, with Russian representatives, we, the United States, and discuss what can be done to end this conflict. We're not doing it. We've said we absolutely will not. That means that you then look at the inventory of weapon weapons at your disposal and you say, well, what else can we use short of a nuclear weapon that's going to harm the Russians that will theoretically induce them to cooperate with us and negotiate, which, of course, is absurd because this is not about uh, weapons. This is about territory. It's about the presence of uh, NATO and NATO capabilities on Russia's borders. We don't want to talk about that. We won't even accept the possibility that Ukraine could be something other than a member of NATO. So under, under the circumstances, what, what is the basis for negotiations? What's the basis for discussion? What's the basis for talks? I don't see any. The Russians would love to sit down and talk to somebody who is willing to examine where we stand. No one will do it. So that's why I call this phase of the war it's no longer the Ukrainian phase. It's now the Biden phase of the war. And the Biden phase of war is long-range strike. Now, why anyone in Washington would think that by destroying targets inside Russia proper is somehow or another going to endear Russia to us and persuade the Russians to throw up their hands and say, please stop, we want to talk, we'll give you what you want, is beyond my imagination. It's the dumbest thing I can imagine. If anything, it's going to persuade the Russians that they must attack and attack decisively to the West. That is not, in my judgment, something that is in our interest or in the interest of NATO. But I'm, I hold the minority opinion, Glenn, and no one agrees with me here in Washington. Well, there seems to be a, a weakness in the logic. I saw recently Mitt Romney giving a an interview where he said that, you know, the investment in this war was uh, excellent because for a mere small percentage of the military budget, they were able to kill a um, lot of Russians and weaken the Russian military, which is great because they have so many nuclear weapons that we would like to see them weakened. But it's, uh, yeah, I've, I had that face expression too <laughs> when, I, when I read it because it just seems, uh, yeah, let's call it a risky policy to seek to militarily attack and degrade an adversary which happens to have more nuclear weapons than anyone else but but uh, but in terms of this escalation this uh, biden phase as you uh, termed it uh, it's well one can see that well, well one can argue there's possible two objectives one would be to get a stronger hand in the negotiations or future negotiations with russia and others might see that this is a way to go into a direct shooting war with the Russians or simply to degrade them. I, it, is there any mood in Russia? Is, no, sorry, is there an appetite in Washington for actually fighting a war with Russia? Or or is this just hoping that we can degrade the Russians without them retaliating? Or is it, is, or is it to set the tables favorable for negotiations? Well, you've raised a, a, a couple of very important questions. First of all, I would argue that there is no appetite in the American electorate for a war with Russia. I don't see any evidence for it. Even among Americans who, for reasons of the Cold War hangover, continue to view Russia as something evil, I've never heard any of them express the willingness to go to war with Russia. So I don't see that in the United States anywhere. No one is talking about a war with Russia. No one wants a war with Russia. People are anxious to avoid war, period, because they look at what's happening on our southern border. They look at what's happening inside the country, where the money is going, millions of dollars going to people that are not even Americans, billions, 
you know, we've got 37 million people who live in the United States who are American citizens below the poverty line. Now, you have to stop and consider that for a minute. Uh, 11 million children who go to bed every night hungry. So the question on American minds is why are we doing something about that? Why are we pouring uh, hundreds of billions of dollars into a potential war that we don't really want to fight? I think this is becoming more acute, which explains why you're hearing more people stand up and question what's happening in Ukraine. When I say more people, I'm talking about the average American citizen. The media doesn't cover it because the media is 100 percent in line with the people controlling our government and controlling the financial sector. They want a war with Russia. That's a small minority, but they're very well financed. So when Mr. Romney opens his mouth and makes these ridiculous assertions, he's really expressing the view held by his donors. Now, he may be a billionaire, but he's part of the club of other billionaires who want the war with Russia. And then, of course, you have someone like Elon Musk, who has the presence of mind to say, we don't want a war with Russia. It's a very stupid idea, which is why he explained what he did about uh, terminating the Starlink uh, connectivity in Ukraine to prevent what he feared would be a, an escalating uh, attack on the Russian fleet in the Black Sea. And, of course, he's then pilloried and attacked and assaulted verbally uh, for, for all sorts of reasons. And her, people are hurling abuse at him left and right. But he's one of the leading billionaires, but he's also one of the very few that won't join the war party. So Washington is in the hands of the war party. They They own it. They have an appetite, but they don't understand what the hell they're doing. They don't even understand what war means. You know, how many how many people who've been wounded from this war or by this war in Ukraine and Russia will never recover? Well, I can tell you on the Ukrainian side, it's very high. If you have two, three hundred thousand people that have been wounded, more than half of those who've been severely wounded will never return to duty on the battlefield because the Ukrainians cannot even evacuate all the severely wounded in time to save their lives. They can't provide them with the medical care they need to save their limbs, their minds, their eyesight. The Russians can do those things. They're much better organized and better positioned to do it, but the Ukrainians cannot. Are we going to join this? Are we, are we willing to join it? Uh, I don't think so. And again, if you look at the numbers of U.S. forces, ground troops that are in Poland, Romania, and the Baltic states, there aren't enough there to launch a serious offensive into Ukraine. And, of course, we'd be at risk of counterstrokes against us, counteroffensives by the Russians, not only in Ukraine, but through Belorussia. So we'd open, up, we'd open up several fronts that we cannot possibly cover and sustain. So there is no rational thinking. It's all impulsive. It's all emotion. It's not rooted in the basis of any serious analysis. Well, if we would have this direct <clears throat> war, but uh, yeah, accidental or intentional, uh, you mentioned we're not in a good position. But uh, how? What would be the ability though, of the United States to fight a direct war with Russia? Again, I know. I remember. Uh, I think it was Obama who expressed concern, given you know, if you're going to fight on the border of Russia, its logistics will obviously be superior as it's uh, closer by. But uh, but with what, what is the current uh, uh, infrastructure for the United States. Uh, how, how well, what would be its main strength and weaknesses if it would fight Russia? Well, remember, you've got an alliance of 32 nations. How many of those nations that are members of the NATO alliance are excited about the prospect of being pulverized by Russian attacks from the air, missiles, rockets, whatever? I mean, are they all rushing to get in line to provide air bases, uh, forward? Uh, you know, refueling points, forward rearming points for NATO forces in Poland, in Hungary, in Slovakia, in Romania, in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. In other words, that's what you'd have to do. Germany would become virtually a logistical fortress. You'd have to have several million troops, to be blunt, because not only do you need a million men on the front lines, you'd have to have another million in the infrastructure sustaining everything. None of the European powers are prepared for this. 
it would take years for us to create the foundations for what I just described. So it's an impossibility. So we're, we're playing a very dangerous game. We're bluffing. You can't bluff about these things. And keep in mind that at some point you'll want to reinforce your, your troop presence as well as your ammunition, you know, your, your medical support. Everything has to be reinforced. How do you cross the Atlantic in a war with Russia? You can't. You're going to lose all the ships quickly that you try to send across to uh, Europe. They'll sink them. They'll disable them with their submarine fleet. And then you have aircraft that can also attack. In other words, everything we do depends upon our ability to project power, which includes logistical support thousands of miles across the ocean. How do you do it? How long would Norway last in this kind of setting? Norway is in very close proximity to Russia. And if Norway says, oh, we'll provide NATO with everything at once, how long would it take the Russians to pulverize every single militarily useful position in Norway? How, how long would it take them to destroy every port facility in Norway, Sweden, Finland? A few days? A few weeks? And then how do you repair it? How do you recover? How do you launch offensive operations at that point? People are not thinking these things through. I can guarantee you that the Russian general staff has thought these things through. I can guarantee you that everything is targeted with high-end conventional precision munitions. Now, is that really the road we want to go down? We haven't even discussed the long-term strategic implications for the West and Russia and the world. The economic dislocation, which is already severe, but it's going to get a lot worse quickly. So I just think that I think there's a complete absence of rational thinking in Washington, and there isn't much help coming from Berlin, Paris, or London. I haven't heard any. I haven't heard anything out of Oslo or Stockholm or Helsinki that makes sense. God help us all, because this doesn't make sense. No, I, 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 I do find the same, uh, yeah, absence of logic. Though there is this. Uh, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think it's just partly because of the the way the media has worked. There is, uh, you know, if people just state very obvious facts that you know, if you NATO in Russia considers NATO to be an existential threat, they will not back down. They will only continue to escalate. You're not allowed to make the argument because you it's, it's been said to legitimize Russia's invasion. So you have this uh, very strange walls you meet in which you can't formulate an argument uh, which criticizes what's being done. So it's a uh, sort of strange position. Um, but uh, how do you still see how Russia could react uh, in another way? Because what I keep hearing from Russia is that uh, this is a different kind of war with different rules, given that it's a proxy war, that Americans and NATO can put themselves in a position where they can kill Russians and degrade the Russian army. However, Russia can't uh, fight back. And this is the problem, of course, is there's no incentive then for uh, the Western side and or for Washington, because well, in Europe we do what Washington tells us. Uh, there's no incentive uh, for Washington to negotiate with the Russians. So what what they need to find is a way of inflicting pain on America. So you know, so they don't have this uh, uh, position of uh, well immunity, if you will. Uh, also, is, is there other ways Russia can strike? And I'm not giving advice. <laughs> is there any other way that uh, the Russians might have been might be thinking about how to uh, hurt the United States outside of Ukraine, perhaps? Well, one of the things that uh, many of us uh, that are not on the side of this war have warned from day one, as far back as January 2022, is that the Russians have the potential or the capacity for horizontal escalation. That means Cuba, Mexico, Nicaragua. Colombia, Venezuela. These are places where the Russians have friends and allies, where they can position capabilities and assets that can be employed against us. When I say capabilities and assets, take your pick. Uh, you can put almost anything you want on the ground in Mexico or Cuba or most of Latin America and launch it at the United States. There's no one there to stop you. The cartels will cooperate, particularly if they think they stand to benefit long-term from it. Uh, 
strategically. Criminality is always willing to cooperate with anyone if they think this is going to improve their position. Beyond that, remember, we're admitting millions of people to our country about whom we know nothing. We have uncontrolled borders. We have open ports. Our coastal waters are not under persistent surveillance. We've got real problems here in the United States that could be exploited in any number of different ways. Uh, so that's part of the answer. You've seen already the willingness for the first time of the Russians to provide modern intercontinental ballistic missile parts, missile bodies, missile technology to North Korea. North Korea now has the capability to deliver a nuclear warhead from an intercontinental ballistic missile launched from North Korea that could reach the United States. That was not true in the past because President Xi resisted any attempt under any circumstances for that capability to emerge. They did not want it. China did not want it. But China relented and decided to go ahead and allow this to happen because China also feels threatened by us. If you're sitting in Beijing and you have a total of six nuclear submarines and the United States insists on talking about your dramatic military buildup and why the United States should be prepared to fight China, Finally, you decide, well, we've only got six nuclear submarines. The rest of our subs are diesel electric and limited to coastal waters. More than 100 of our 300 ships are pure Coast Guard vessels for coastal water patrol. Most of our Navy is not capable of long-range operations. Our armies are not organized to go anywhere and fight. Well, I guess we better support the Russians, because if Russia fails for some reason, we're next on America's menu. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, people are listening to what we say. They are looking at where we're spending our money, and they are looking at what we say we are prepared to do to them. This is catastrophe. We are building alliances against us. We're causing people to take actions they would otherwise not take, such as the one we just saw in North Korea. Now, people will sit back and say, well, the North Koreans aren't crazy. They're not going to launch such a missile because if they struck us with a nuclear weapon, we would incinerate North Korea. I tend to think that's true. But nevertheless, the prospect is terrifying to me that you have a state like North Korea with that capability. Is that an accident? Of course it's not an accident. That's a clear and unambiguous signal from President Putin. We've done this in North Korea. Where else can we do similar things? What kinds of things can they undertake in the Middle East? They have friends in Iran. They have friends in many Middle Eastern countries. Remember, the BRICS is now admitting the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are going to do business in something other than dollars. What does this mean for the petrodollar? In other words, we've done enormous damage to ourselves across the range of human activity. and We don't seem to pay any attention to it. We're not thinking about it. We're dismissing it. We are emotionally committed to destroying Russia. That's insanity. Because if you were looking at anything from a rational perspective, and you look at Ukraine on the map, the first conclusion you reach is, gee, this is wonderful. Let's have a neutral Ukraine. If the place is neutral, that puts hundreds of miles between NATO forces in Eastern Europe and Russian forces in, in Russian Europe. Isn't that a good thing? Of course it is. But what have we done? We've destroyed that option. We've resisted that option because the objective is not to promote peace, not to create stability, not to find a balance of forces and interests with which everyone can live. Instead, it's to destroy another country. And why should we be surprised that the Russians have reacted the way they do? It's insanity. I would react exactly as the Russians have. And I think we should expect the Russians, given these long-range strikes, to answer our strikes in kind. Well, uh, before we wrap this up, do you have any uh, predictions? What's going to happen in this uh, Biden stage? Or is it uh, the pure unpredictability from here on? Well, the Biden phase is uh, probably the final phase because the Ukrainians are not going to be able to do much on the ground anymore. So the Biden phase of long-range strike uh, 
involving U.S., French, German uh, capabilities and British capabilities, uh, that seems to be it. That's about all there is right now and all there's likely to be for a while. The question is, what do the Russians do about it? And again, uh, I don't know, but I think that the incentive to exercise restraint, which is what's happened thus far, is no longer that great. I think the inducement to act is enormous. So I would expect action. Where will it occur? Will it occur down in the area around Odessa? Will it occur up and around Kharkov? Will it occur near Kiev itself? When I talk about action, Russian forces, I don't know. They have numerous forces. There, there's no shortage of Russian military manpower or capability at this point. So the chessboard belongs to them for all intents and purposes. Well, this has been very enlightening. So uh, thank you very much for your time, Colonel. And uh, uh, I feel we always end up on a very <laughs> pessimistic notes, but uh, I guess that's warranted in this war. So uh, uh, thanks again, Colonel. Uh, very sure. much appreciated. All the best. Thank you, too.